Breakdown Fire Suspect says it wasn't me. Minister of Health, Guyana is still a long way from achieving herd immunity. Guyana recorded GDP growth of 14.5% despite COVID-19 pandemic challenges, according to the Ministry of Finance. In the region, Venezuela reopens the land border with Colombia, and internationally, Facebook products harms children through occupation with support. Greetings and welcome to another edition of Channel 2 Headline News Update. I am Bibi Bacchus. Thank you for joining us. A man who allegedly confessed to starting a fire at the Brigdam police station, damaging more than 80% of the structure, is now denying starting the fire. He is accusing the Ghana police force of assaulting him during interrogation and forcing him to sign a confession statement. 26-year-old Clarence Green of Princess Street Lodge was arrested earlier Saturday morning and placed in the Brigdam lockups for an alleged armed robbery. Green claims that officers found no items on him during his search before detaining him in the detention cell. Due to the fire, the inmates from the breakdown holding cells were taken to the Spirendam police station along with Green. Later, Green stated that he was transported to the CID headquarters, where officers coerced him into signing a statement presented to him. When asked for the document to be read to him, since he cannot read it, he claims that he was told to simply sign it. However, the Ghana police force is refuting claims made by Green. In his statement, the Ghana police force said no written statement was ever signed by Green. Police also indicated that they only had a video recording confession of Green regarding his role in the torching of the wooden police station building that held the headquarters of Ghana's largest police division. The Ministry of Finance's mid-year report for 2021 has indicated that Guyana has recorded gross domestic product growth of 14.5% while non-oil GDP grew by 4.8% despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and even the devastating floods experienced in mid-June. The revised full-year forecast for real GDP growth in 2021 is now 19.5% overall and 3.7% for the non-oil economy. The agricultural, forestry, and fishing industries for the first half of 2021 are estimated to have declined by 2.4% compared to a 4.1% decline last year. The sugar industry declined by 22.4% when compared to the same period in 2020 due to the floods. The rice industry grew by an estimated 7.8%. Other crops declined by 7.3% due to the floods. Livestock industry was estimated to have grown by 10.6% when compared to the same period in 2020. However, the fishing industry declined by an estimated 6.6% and the forestry industry by 7.1%. The mining and quarry industries grew by 23.1% with higher output from the petroleum and other mining industries despite reductions in gold and bauxite. The petroleum sector increased by 65.4%. Diamonds, sand and stone were estimated to have seen a total growth of 63%. Manufacturing sector notably saw an estimated growth of 13.1%. Earlier this year, Senior Finance Minister Dr. Ashni Singh had indicated that Guyana would be one of the fastest growing economies in terms of real GDP and would see a rapid transformation in several sectors, especially since government would make efforts to boost the non-oil economy as well. The mid-year report is expected to be tabled by Dr. Singh at the first sitting of the National Assembly once the Assembly resumes after its current recess. The National Media Report for Guyana may look promising, but this may not be the same for the region. A recent report published by the World Bank is urging Latin America and Caribbean countries to restructure their economies and enhance growth to avoid another lost decade. According to the World Bank research, the scars from COVID-19 crisis will take years to disappear if countries in Latin America and the Caribbean do not take quick steps to boost an already weak recovery from the pandemic, with poverty now at its highest level in decades. Although regional growth is expected to rebound to 6.3% in 2021, with vaccination rates increasing and COVID-19 deaths decreasing, most nations will fall short of revising the 6.7% contraction that occurred last year. Furthermore, growth predictions for the following two years fall below 3%, returning to the poor growth rate of the 2010s and fueling concerns about another lost decades of development. According to the research, the region has to urgently execute long-delaying but possible reforms in infrastructure, education, health, energy policy, and innovations, as well as address new problems posed by climate change to achieve the kind of development rates that will propel the region ahead and reduce societal tension. 
expansion. The last decade referred to the period of slow to negative economic growth, lasting almost 10 years. Don't go away after the break. Ministry of Health, Ghana is still a long way from achieving herd immunity, and police are investigating a fatal stabbing of a minor at Abana Pakdam. When you need money and you gotta get it fast. Creative Jewelry and Pawn Shop is the place for that confidential transaction in a quiet and secure location. You'll get the highest value per penny weight for your gold and also enjoy the lowest interest rates and longest payback period too. Yes, for that instant transaction to solve a pressing financial problem. That Creative Jewelry and Pawn Shop, 4 to 6 Boyle Place, that's between the Ministry of Housing on Brick Dam and White Castle Fish Shop. Be your first and only choice. Creative Jewelry and Pawn Shop. Safe and sound. Solid and secure. Always there for you. Telephone 231-7878 and 223-89. Its milk has remained the same until now. Introducing the Great Dairy Full Cream Milk from Alabama Trading. Enriched with vitamins A to D and calcium to promote healthy teeth, strong bones, and vitality. Great Dairy Milk is delicious and fortified to encourage healthy cell growth within the body. No wonder it's the number one brand of milk produced in Ireland. Now available nationwide in 400 gram packages at leading supermarkets and wholesale vendors. Distributed by Alabama Trading. Welcome to Kasum's Furniture. Find everything you need for your home and more under one roof in our newly decorated showroom. Our locally crafted furniture has been perfected over the last 60 years. From our hands to your home, we also bring to you our newly introduced lines of imported furniture and sleep center where you can find a wide range of beds and mattresses. Kisun's Furniture, furnishing homes for over 60 years. Survival Shopping Complex brings to you its delivery service, Shop Through WhatsApp. This process is simple. All you need to do is call or message your grocery list to 613-9683 and we will select your items for you and have them delivered directly to you, even out of town. This is convenient because we can stay on the phone with you as we select your favorite brands. We're happy to do your shopping for you. Contact us on WhatsApp today and shop Price Smart at Survival Shopping Complex. Welcome back. 
Minister of Health Dr. Frank Anthony said Ghana is a long way from achieving herd immunity during a COVID-19 update today. We're still a, a, a far way off because depending on what variant we're dealing with, uh, the percentage of the population that needs to be immunized would go up. Um, right now, some of the experts believe that uh, with the Delta strain, you have to get closer to 90% of your population being fully immunized. Uh, so we are still a far away from that, and we have to work to make sure that as much people as possible can be immunized. One of the challenges that we have had is that there is no vaccine that has been approved for persons 11 years and lower. Uh, we are hopeful that um, in November that the U.S. FDA would approve for vaccines in this low age category, at least from 5 to 11. And when uh, that is done, uh, we will then be able to introduce vaccine for this age cohort. So there is still a substantive part of our population that cannot receive a vaccine because no vaccine has been approved for that age category as yet. Minister Anthony said with the increased number of COVID-19 patients at the health facilities, the ministry is acquiring an oxygen plant to generate oxygen to reduce the financial pressure on the ministry to purchase oxygen on a day-to-day -day basis. We have 136 cases in the various hospitals across the country. We have at the Ocean View facility 91 uh, patients with 34 of those patients in the ICU. We also have a number of maternal cases that are positive for COVID-19. Uh, we have 16 such patients, six of whom are at the uh, Ocean View facility and uh, the rest at the GPHC. Um, we, we are working to uh, improve generation of oxygen on site and um, right now we're expecting to have an oxygen plant uh, coming in shortly that we'll be setting up at the Ocean View facility so that we can self-generate our own oxygen. Uh, that would help to reduce the amount of oxygen that we have to purchase on a daily basis. So as of today we have 81 patients of the 136 that requires oxygen and as you can imagine um, consumption of oxygen is um, taking a lot of resources uh, from the ministry. Minister Anthony said there are 3,816 active cases and 251 persons tested positive over the past 24 hours. He said a large number of persons are in home isolation. However, if you believe you have been exposed to COVID-19, isolate at home for five days before getting a PCR test done. If you've been exposed to someone, the preference would be that you quarantine at home and then you do the test after about five days. The reason why we're doing the test after five days and not immediately because um, after five days, if you were infected, you'll have enough viral loads so that we would then be able to detect it using the PCR. To date, 71% of the adult population have gotten the first dose of the vaccine, while 42% have been fully inoculated. In the 12 to 17 age group, 34.8% received the first dose and 19.1% were fully immunized. The ministry will begin administering the Pfizer vaccine to pregnant and breastfeeding women. As such, the minister reiterated that they should get vaccinated. Again, I want to make a special appeal to pregnant women to get vaccinated. All the international uh, bodies have recommended, international bodies dealing with obstetrics, um, have recommended that women who are pregnant uh, should get the COVID-19 vaccine because it would protect them from getting the infection. And as you can see on a daily basis, we are seeing uh, pregnant women in Guyana who are positive for COVID. Now this can, if you are vaccinated, it reduces the severity of the disease and therefore in some instances can protect you from getting the more complicated form of this disease. So I want to urge women to make sure that uh, they really 
get the vaccine. You can get any one of the vaccines that we're giving for adults, but we know some people prefer the um, mRNA Pfizer vaccine, and therefore we have extended uh, the use of Pfizer to pregnant women and breastfeeding women. And it doesn't matter any time during the pregnancy. So whether it's um, at the beginning, the middle, or coming on to the um, nearer to when you're ready to deliver, um, you can get it at any stage um, during the pregnancy. And for breastfeeding women, um, it is important that you also uh, get vaccinated if you have not been vaccinated, because once you're vaccinated, the antibodies that you produce can pass through the breast milk and protect uh, the baby. So it's important that you do so. Dr. Anthony also made a call for persons with cancer-related issues to get vaccinated since cancer is considered code mobility. One of the most prestigious societies uh, dealing with the treatment of cancer has recommended that you should, if you, if you have a, uh, any form of cancer, that you should really go and get the COVID-19 vaccine. We know that um, persons with cancer, it, it can be considered as one of the comorbidities, and therefore it would put you at increased risk uh, for COVID-19. The vaccines that we are using are all good for cancer patients, and so there's no risk in using any one of those vaccines. The minister also emphasized that caregivers of cancer patients get vaccinated. Someone who is more vulnerable, that's the cancer patient, um, and you have a caregiver that is unvaccinated, the chances are that person can uh, bring the infection to the vulnerable person and put them more at risk. So it is important that not just the caregiver, but everyone in the household uh, should get vaccinated because it helps to protect that vulnerable person in the household. A minor is in police custody tonight, responsible for the fatal stabbing of a Bartica minor, who he alleges always tormented him. Esther Sobers has more. Police are investigating a fatal stabbing at the Obana Bagdam Korobong Putaro on Monday. Dead is 38 year old Ion Anthony Ramnarain, a minor from Church Avenue in Bartico. Investigations revealed that the deceased and the suspect, a 25 year old male, are known to each other since their campus are next to each other. The suspect is in the habit of cursing and talking to himself. Ram Narayan would throw hints at him and call him names. On Monday around 11 a.m., the suspect left his camp to take a knife for his father to scrape an engine head at the war ground. Whilst he was passing Ram Narayan camp, the two ended up in an argument. The deceased allegedly picked up a piece of wood and latched the suspect with it on his head and left foot, which resulted in them fighting. The suspect, armed with a knife, dealt Ram Narayan several stab wounds to his body. He fell to the ground motionless. The suspect went to his father and told him what happened. When the police arrived at the scene, the suspect handed over the knife to the police and admitted stabbing the deceased during a fight. The body was examined and 11 suspected stab wounds were seen on the left hand, chest, abdomen and back. A piece of wood was found next to the body. The body of the deceased and the suspect were taken to the Madhya Hospital. The suspect was seen and examined while the body of Ram Narayan was pronounced dead. The suspect was placed into custody as further investigations are in progress. For Channel 2 Headline News, Esther Silvers. Thanks, Esther. The cause of death of the 13-year-old from Region 1 who collapsed and passed away shortly after receiving his second dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine on Monday was listed as a major brain bleed and heart illness. Government pathologist Dr. Nihal Singh conducted a post-mortem on Tuesday, which revealed that the teen had experienced significant brain bleeding before collapsing and subsequently passing away. Shortly after returning home from taking the vaccine, the child noticed his fingers changing colors. He was rushed to the hospital and subsequently pronounced dead on arrival. However, the Ministry of Health is continuing its investigation. Don't go away after the break. Brazil faces a growing hunger crisis with COVID and Facebook products harms children, stroke division whistleblower but before that here's the bridge retraction schedule
Survival Shopping Complex brings to you its delivery service, Shop Through WhatsApp. This process is simple. All you need to do is call or message your grocery list to 613-9683 and we will select your items for you and have them delivered directly to you, even out of town. This is convenient because we can stay on the phone with you as we select your favorite brands. We're happy to do your shopping for you. Contact us on WhatsApp today and shop price smart at Survival Shopping Complex. Good, good girl, forget things. Good. What's the problem, Granny? I want money for bar for doing surgery. I was dancing and I fall and fractured my hip. If you need some quick money, you should check Lenders Jewelry and Pawn Shop. Lenders Jewelry and Pawn Shop, Lot 238 South Road Border, Georgetown. Get jewelry made to order in just 72 hours. We also accept vehicles. Lenders, best rates, longest payback period. Boys, I get you. Plus, I could dance again. <laughs> Lenders Jewelry and Pawn Shop. Kingdom-based taxi service, transportation for every occasion. Short drop, airport, weddings, funerals, and much more. We're located at Lot H. Durban and Vicingen Road, next to Green City Bar. For honest, efficient, and reliable service, call Kingdom-based taxi service at 648-5959 or 227-7937. You can count on us. Welcome back. Now we take a look at news in the region and around the world. Venezuela has reopened its land border with Colombia for the first time in almost three years. President Nicolas Maduro had closed the crossing in 2019 amid a diplomatic rift between the South American neighbors. Al Jazeera's Alessandro Rampietti reports. After nearly three years of being closed, Venezuelan authorities removed the shipping containers, physically blocking the main bridge connecting the country with Colombia. 
In a nationally televised address on Monday, Vice President Delcy Rodriguez said it was time to turn the page. Thinking of our people and the brotherhood and cooperation between the people of Colombia and Venezuela, President Maduro has taken the decision to open the crossing for commerce. In 2019, President Maduro broke off diplomatic ties with Colombia and sealed the border, after Venezuelan opposition members attempted to bring international humanitarian aid into the country. The aid was backed by the United States and Bogotá. Maduro saw the aid as part of a plot to overthrow him. But the border had been officially closed since 2015, bringing a halt to trade between the two countries that amounted to 7 billion US dollars a year. Colombian President Ivan Duque welcomed the news but said the reopening would be gradual. Colombia, está dispuesta. Colombia is also willing to begin an orderly process so that we can guarantee this border crossing. But I am going to be very clear, this is not going to be done clumsily and it is not going to be done suddenly. Tens of thousands of Venezuelans cross into Colombia daily for goods and services. Some 1.8 million have resettled in Colombia, fleeing the country's economic collapse. Most resorted to using illegal crossings controlled by gangs and armed groups. The reopening can also help reduce the role that armed groups have achieved at the border. Both Colombians, like ELN rebels and paramilitaries, and also Venezuelan gangs, who were profiting from people's needs to cross. On Tuesday, Venezuelans were overjoyed. It's the best thing that has happened to us. We spent two years passing through illegal roads, as we have so many needs that we can only fulfill in Colombia. The decision will bring relief to people on both sides of the border, but it will probably do little to help restore relations between the two countries that remain at odds. Colombia does not recognize Maduro as the legitimate president of Venezuela, and it continued to support efforts to push for regime change in the country. Alessandro Ampietti, Al Jazeera, Bogotá. With the economic fallout from the ravages of COVID-19, a growing number of people in Brazil are struggling to afford food. Unemployment has forced millions into poverty, while rising food prices and scaled back government aid means many are fighting just to survive. Al Jazeera's Teresa Bo reports. Eating every day has become a challenge for people like Eriston, a former prisoner who lives on the streets of Rio de Janeiro. Surviving here the past year, he says, has been a challenge. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the streets are very crowded and everything has become very difficult. Now no one stops here to help us. There are a lot of people dying because they couldn't get emergency aid. The impact of COVID-19 has devastated Brazil. Almost 600,000 people have lost their lives and millions have been forced into poverty amid rising food prices and unemployment. Researchers say at least 19 million Brazilians are struggling for food. And recent images of people scavenging animal carcasses for scraps of food have shocked the country, as the difficulties people are facing each day sink in. I've taken meat from the truck many times. We take the meat and are happy. But now there's a lot of demand because everyone has caught on to it. They're either taking it from the truck or straight from the supermarket. At the beginning of the pandemic, Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro campaigned against lockdowns, saying hunger was worse than COVID-19. That's why last year, the government distributed emergency cash handouts to help families and businesses. But this year, government aid has been dramatically scaled back. Bolsonaro's problem is that, on the one hand, he has a very new liberal uh, minister of economics that uh, does not want to spend does not want uh, to provide direct help for, for the population. Bolsonaro always campaigned against the program. So he would say that Bolsa Familia was uh, an immediate help, that Lula and the, 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 the politicians from the Workers' Party, from PT, used to buy people's votes, to buy people's um, goodwill. Right, so uh, as an assistentialist uh, program that would keep people from working. And there's an ideolo ideological barrier there. At this soup kitchen in Rio, hundreds of people are showing every day to receive a meal. They're in desperate need of help. I was working, I had a job, I rented an apartment and I was able to pay the rent. 
I worked and earned a salary every month. Then the pandemic came, I lost my job, I couldn't pay my rent anymore. Volunteers in this soup kitchen say most of those coming here face a similar situation. They have lost their jobs and cannot afford to pay a rent anymore. 20 years ago, Brazil became a success story when government programs pushed millions of people out of poverty. Now, it's an example of the government's inability to deal with the consequences of COVID-19. Teresa Bo, Al Jazeera. And internationally, Facebook executives have denied accusations the social media platform is damaging to girls' mental health, weakening democracy and source division after a whistleblower's testimony to U.S. Congress. But Facebook's CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, says his company's findings have been taken out of context. Al Jazeera has more. Francis Haugen presented a damning picture of Facebook as a company knowingly disseminating false information that could incite anger and hatred among users, negatively impact teenage mental health and even stoke ethnic violence. The goal, she says, to increase the time users spend on Facebook and Instagram actively engaging with posts and then potentially being exposed to more advertising which they would click on. This is how Facebook makes its money. I saw Facebook repeatedly encounter conflicts between its own profits and our safety. Facebook consistently resolved these conflicts in favor of its own profits. The result has been more division, more harm, more lies, more threats, and more combat. In some cases, this, this dangerous online talk has led to actual violence that harms and even kills people. What makes Haugen's testimony so important is that she has the documentation to back up her claims. Tens of thousands of internal pieces of paperwork that reveal Facebook's knowledge of the consequences of its actions allegedly in its pursuit of profit. Haugen called for more transparency and oversight over the algorithms Facebook uses. It's like the Department of Transportation regulating cars by only watching them drive down the highway. Facebook has called Haugen's testimony selective and misleading, but both Republicans and Democrats on the committee expressed skepticism of the company's truthfulness. They knew what they were doing. They knew where the violations were, and they know they are guilty. Mark Zuckerberg ought to be looking at himself in the mirror today and yet, rather than taking responsibility and showing leadership, Mr. Zuckerberg is going sailing. But there is an active debate underway about how much regulation to impose. After all, who is going to decide what is inflammatory speech and what is simply information that the powerful don't want the rest of us to hear? A starting point, though, does seem to be more transparency. Transparency about the algorithms Facebook is using to make us angry in the first place, and also more information about all the data Facebook is harvesting about all of us. There was actual empirical data supporting all of these downstream harms of the way the platform works. Um, those issues that are really at the integration of both, you know, the way data is used, this what we call surveillance capitalism, where the user is tracked everywhere they go, and then that data is mined and used to target them and try to get them to engage. Haugen has filed several complaints with the Securities and Exchange Commission, alleging with her documentation that Facebook has misled its investors and Congress in the past. And she's clear, it is founder, chairman and CEO Mark Zuckerberg who controls Facebook's behavior. She had Britansi Al Jazeera, Capitol Hill. And that is it for today's regional and international news. Here now is your 3D weather forecast.
it for this edition of Headline News Updates. Tune in on Thursday at 7 p.m. for another episode. Be sure to subscribe, like, and follow us on Facebook and YouTube. Until then, please take care of yourself and each other.